welcome to the EVE keynote. Please welcome on stage EVE Senior Community Manager and a beautiful human being, CCP Falcon. Wow, look at all you guys. Welcome to the EVE Online keynote. Are you all having a good time? Yeah. Wonderful. Wow, those lights are really bright. I had a rough night last night. So it's so good to be back on stage at Vegas. And it's so good to see so many Vegas regulars here. And we've got a lot of new faces this year, too. It's nice to see that uh, the community over here is expanding a little bit. So we've got a lot to talk about. And pretty soon, I'm going to hand you over to some familiar faces from CCP. Uh, I think you just saw a couple of them there. Uh, and we're going to give you a lot of information about what's coming to New Eden in the near and more distant future. But first, I want to take a quick look back at what's been going on since we were last out here in the desert. So 2018 was a pretty busy year for both the community and for CCP too. We saw the release of Lifeblood last October, which brought new refineries and moon mining, and we celebrated Eve's 15th anniversary with a pretty amazing fan fest. How many of you guys were there? Very many? Mm. It's pretty good. I like it. Right after that, into the abyss hit tranquility as well. And we've seen really great activity over the summer as two of the largest coalitions in New Eden decided they wanted to get angry and start shooting the shit out of each other. <laughs> so, with the advent of upwell structures, we've seen a new era for capture layers. The amount of player infrastructure that's gone up in the last year or so has been absolutely incredible. It's clear that you guys really are starting to become masters of your own domain. The next set of structures that are coming are upwell navigation structures. And you guys might have heard a little bit about them already. There's been some rough stuff on Singularity and whatnot. Uh, and these are going to bring us pretty much to parity with old Starbase infrastructure. So one of the next steps is going to be the retirement of Starbases once this last round of structures is in your hands. So while in K-Space, you guys have been continuing to project your influence, build infrastructure, you've also started to reach out into the unknown too, with Into the Abyss. Taking on the Triglavian Collective, you guys have started to explore Abyssal Dead Space and really reap the rewards. True to the nature of the community, we've seen all manner of shenanigans in Abyssal Dead Space, including some interesting tactics and some pretty lucky use of mutaplasmids too. We've also seen uh, some insanely expensive losses some big windfalls, and even some crazy guy who decided it would be a good idea to go in an in Elogy Cruiser for some reason. You know, it's, you know, no, there's been typical Eve madness since release day when we put Into the Abyss out. Uh, and in true form, every single avenue of min maxing has been explored by you guys, and it's been really great to see. Uh, even trying to head in there with a luxury yacht full of exotic dancers, drugs, and booze was tried. as some form of kind of weird triglavian bribery. You guys are nothing if not inventive, you know? Ironically, before we patched that out, the sneaky pilot who was involved actually used a post-downtime login exploit to get back out again when he realized what a shit mistake he's made. Uh, but given how traumatized his uh, party crew were on board, we decided just to let it slip. He was, uh, it was in enough trouble already. So um, it's been really great to hear all these stories. And you know, as, the, as one of the community guys for CCP, you guys just never cease to amaze me in the crazy shit that you do. Uh, and it's good to see you sharing these stories too. What's been better though, is to see player reaction and ingenuity when it's come to creating content. There's, uh, there's really some awesome stories that have come out of Abyssal Dead Space. And you guys aren't the only ones who've uh, been having, let's say, your ups and downs with it. Uh, on day one of Abyssal Dead Space being live, I managed to time out. Uh, less than 10 kilometers from the origin conduit in one of my first sites. Uh, wouldn't have been so bad, but I had a Lashak blueprint in my cargo hold. And they were selling for like 50 bill at the time. So yeah, I raged so hard, like my cats ran for cover. My neighbors thought I was being ax murdered. It was, yeah, it was, a, it was a real shitty mess. And of course, I've also been a victim of the ever-present tornado gang squad on my return to K-Space 2. Uh, similar levels of rage occurred here as well. But uh, the one thing that I do love is I always find it amazing that after 16 years of playing EVE, it's the only experience that can elicit this kind of reaction for me. It's the only thing that really gets the rage flowing. Uh, and also, uh, 
Special thanks to CCV Loki for the dramatic reenactment there and for rubbing salt into my wounded ego. We have a really uh, special relationship, the two of us. He's a, he's a beautiful human being. He's wonderful. So we've also learned a lot by running an event through the agency around Abyssal Dead Space 2. And we saw a huge spike in Abyssal activity during the course of it. Uh, CCB Rise is going to be here pretty soon to talk to you guys a little more about Abyssal Dead Space and what's coming up for it in the winter. There's some pretty exciting stuff on the way. Some of you guys might have seen a little telltales on Singularity and whatnot so far. God bless you, Hobo Leaks. Um, and there's some, yeah, there's some exciting stuff that's coming that's going to add to some already core solid gameplay. So we can't wait to hear your feedback on it. It's going to be pretty cool. But back in K-Space, you guys have just once again been at the forefront of colonization and exploration. It's unbelievable to see how many structures have been anchored, and it's great to see that pretty much all activity in industry, including research and manufacturing, has now transitioned over to Opal structures. Of course, we do know as well that structure proliferation is a big concern for you guys, so we're keeping a close eye on how structures are used to. More importantly, we're keeping a really close eye on the meta around how they're deployed and utilized, both as permanent homes and as staging points when you guys kick off a conflict. That said, the cycle of life and death always continues in New Eden. As structures are put up, they're kicked down. Capsuleers have a need to see things burn now and again. You know, and 2018 has been no exception. Since the start of the year, we've seen the death of 6,032 citadels, 5,216 refineries, and 3,155 engineering complexes. That's a total of 14,403 structures as of the start of October. So yeah, all those fireworks, 26.7 trillion isk so far this year. So you guys are doing a good job. Give yourselves a round of applause. I've, see, this is what I love about you guys. I've never ever experienced people who are so happy and enthusiastic about just ruining things. It's, it's beautiful. <laughs> Makes me feel right at home. So activity over the course of this summer has been fantastic. Uh, and a big part of that has been, obviously, the two largest coalitions in the game pounding each other's sound castles under the ground. Look at it. <laughs> Sweet Jesus. <laughs> so the war between Imperial Legacy and the North has set new records, and it's been an it's just been unbelievable to see just a savage commitment to blowing shit up. You guys are second to none. The mobilization of forces has been the biggest we've seen in the history of New Eden, and it's resulted in some of the most costly fights we've ever seen too. It's been unbelievable to watch. So we've seen some incredible stories, both on the political and military front, some monumental victories, some great tactics, and some crushing defeats too. Some costly ones as well, whether that's wrecks on the field or, you know, a few faction photosars paid under the table here and there uh, to stop people from shooting at each other. It's, uh, it's been great for everyone at CCP to see the community so active and shooting the hell out of each other too. That's always fun. The fights in X-47, 9-TAC-4 and ULX have just been astonishing to watch. They're also amazing examples of how far our pilots are willing to go in terms of escalation. And of course, they're great examples of how much commitment our pilots have to EVE. You guys just knock it out of the park every time. It's unreal. And sometimes they're also great examples of the sheer perseverance our community has to be able to make it through some of these drawn out slugfests. And I use the word persevere because at CCP, we've been aware that things this year haven't been rainbows and butterflies in a lot of these big fights. This is where we get to the serious stuff. <laughs> We saw issues with the deployment of our chat system in March, and we're still looking to iron out kinks with it. So we know it's not quite right just yet. We've seen a number of node deaths too during major fights, and we've also seen significant issues with our login systems this year as well. But this is something that we're actively working on. If we're being brutally honest, we know that we missed the mark by a long shot this year in, the term, in terms of the community's expectations for server performance in a lot of these big fights. We recognize that, and we want to make sure that we work with you guys and for you guys to make sure that we improve performance of even these types of engagements, because they really are the bread and butter of what makes the game so great. <laughs> On the theme of being direct about these kinds of issues, though, um, the level of activity over the summer genuinely surprised, uh, surprised CCP. I mean, it, it took us completely out of the blue. Uh, and we've been spending a substantial amount of time over the summer playing catch-up 
um, and making sure that we harden our infrastructure because, you know, the shit really hits the fan when there's a big political flare up and we've really learned that this year, definitely. Um, <laughs> So part of doing this has been looking at what services we can move off tranquility into the cloud, just to give TQ a little bit more breathing room. Things like the chat system, which is now running independently, but uh, there's obviously still some issues we still need to work out with it, and we're working on them. It's, it's getting there, guys, come on. So we've been doing a little bit of experimentation too with projects like shutting off parts of the bounty system during large-scale engagements, just to see how it impacts server performance. And the results from this have been great. We're learning a lot, especially when you guys get into a big brawl, and we can actually look at what's going on behind the scenes in more detail. There's a lot of other services, too, that we're investigating the potential for moving them off TQ and into the cloud. Uh, and that's going to give us even more overhead. We're always breaking new ground in this respect, and we're hoping the community can assist us even more in continuing to make even its associated services more robust. So if you see a mass test out there, or you just want to get into a big brawl and give us a lot of data to play with, by all means, let's do it. Because every, you know, every round that gets fired, every doomsday that goes off, that gives us information to be able to help you guys out more and to improve performance. On the software side, there's always a lot more we can do to give TQ breathing room to make these large scale engagements better too. We're exploring every single avenue we can in order to do this. We can also make improvements on the client side as well. And one of the key steps in this journey is the transition to a 64-bit client. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this will allow Eve to unlock the potential for newer gaming machines. It'll allow the client to use more than four gig of RAM, and it'll just give them access to more system resources. And we're super happy to announce that this project is almost complete, and 64-bit EVE Online will be in your hands in early 2019. So on the hardware side, we've also recently taken delivery of six new blades from our friends at Lenovo with uh, Intel Xeon Gold 5122 chips in them. Pretty soon, we'll be adding these to TQ, and this is going to give us an extra 40 nodes so we'll be running on five, on five flex center chassis rather than four. This is quite a substantial upgrade for TQ. While this isn't going to increase the maximum capacity we can support in one solar system, it's going to give us way more scalability options for reinforcement and just spreading the load out so that we can host more systems all at once. Towards the end of the year, we're going to look at putting together a blog for you guys that outlines the hardware TQ is running on these days and how it's evolved from TQ Tech 3. Because there's been a lot of movement since then. And we know you guys love tech blogs, right? Yeah? yeah. So we'll, uh, when the winter gets dark in Iceland, we'll get behind the keyboard and just start putting this stuff together for you guys. Like we said in the blog a couple of months back on the subject, we're constantly working up to keep up with you guys in terms of server performance. It's been a 15-year ongoing journey for us. And it's an unwinnable war that we know we're never going to win, but we'll stay committed to, because we want you guys to be able to bring more and more people. We're always looking at ways to improve server performance on both the hardware and software front. But we need to stay grounded, and we need to understand that there's no silver bullet for this. You guys give us the most, it's a luxury problem, but you guys give us the most unbelievable technical challenge that's out there in gaming. And we're going to continue to work with you guys and for you guys to improve the performance as we go forward. In terms of moving forward, the future's looking very bright for EVE. And we're currently working towards welcoming our Chinese players back into the fold as well. We're building an incredible relationship with a new partner in China, NetEase. And we're already seeing incredible progress as we prepare for pilots to flood back onto Serenity. It's been tough for them for the last couple of years, given the fact that since October 2016, we haven't been able to provide them with new content. And they've been kind of in a holding pattern. So that situation has now come to an end. And when Serenity reopens, our Chinese pilots are going to experience the largest expansion in the history of New Eden. They're going to receive the Ascension expansion. And they're also going to get lifeblood. And they're also going to get into the abyss all in one go with every release in between as well. So that's going to be pretty sweet for those guys. You have no idea how difficult that is technically. So as we look forward to the future of New Eden, we see EVE as one global experience. 
While we do have a separate cluster for our Chinese players, we want to ensure that Serenity and TQ stay as close to parity as possible at all times. This means we'll be looking to keep Serenity one release behind TQ at the most, so both clusters can benefit from new features and content at the same time. There'll still be some content that's going to be exclusive to each server, such as skins, apparel, that kind of thing. And of course, given the differences, wait for it, Given the differences the market, you know, in the markets that uh, Tranquility and Serenity serve, there'll be differences in monetization options and what's on offer in that respect too, because the Chinese gaming market and the English-speaking gaming market are very different. This does, of course, mean that when you guys are screaming CC please after you see a cool Serenity-only skin, there's a lot more likelihood that some of them will make it to TQ in one form or another. <laughs> Including all the ones you see on the screen right now are coming to TQ very soon. So, right now our team are in the process of optimizing these skins to meet graphical performance standards for TQ, and you'll see some of them appearing in the New Eden store in the not too distant future. So, speaking of the future, I'm gonna love you guys and leave you. We've taken a look back over the last year and all the crazy stuff you guys have been up to. Now it's time to take a look at what's in store for the future with these two beautiful gentlemen here. Couldn't have timed that better. To show you guys some cool stuff, please welcome CCP Burger, Creative Director for EVE Online. Uh, thank you, Falcon. Such an idiot. Hi, EVE Akers. How are you doing? Yeah? Having fun? Anyone drunk? I mean, we're all responsible. Pilots, aren't we? No shenanigans. Shenanigans, definitely my favorite word. Whoa, 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 guys, don't stop clicking my slides. Uh, someone in the back clicking my slides, it's, it's a good, good sport. So, super happy to be here, super happy to see all the familiar faces, um, both from FanFest and, and Vegas and other player gatherings. Um, I started playing EVE just after I joined CCP eight years ago. Um, I had a really rough start. Some of you were at FanFest and maybe heard my story about how I was completely uh, butterfly effect by a coworker. Um, but these days I, I mostly do PVE and, and then I haul stuff from high sec to the fringes of space for super good markup. So, you know, gotta steal that null money, you know. Um, this year I've also gotten into watching a lot of live streaming. And I've either, even wanted into the Twitch chat, the dangerous place of Twitch chat. Uh, I started with YouTube a um, couple of years ago, and, and then kind of with Abyssal Dead Space, I really, I really got into Twitch. And uh, holy hell, the production value of some of you guys' work, amazing, 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 amazing. Um, most of the videos you're seeing here in the keynote are actually shot in client. Um, using prototype code uh, and using a thing called 3D Mouse. We really love kind of the stuff that we're getting from 3D Mouse, so we're actually gonna deploy this code in November for all your video enthusiasts to really up your game. We have, we have a couple of demo stations set up in the, in the Nova playtest room, so give it a go tomorrow and Sunday. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, as Falcon talked about earlier, a lot of effort has gone into getting EVE China up and running with our partner NetEase in China. Um, every team at, in EVE Dev has actually contributed to this effort, and I really just want to give them a shout out because this has been monumental. Um, the Chinese server is super, like, is super important to us and ultimately you. Because the more successful it will be, the more resources we have to make EVE even better. So, yeah, let's, let's make it work. <laughs> and, and the goal is, as Falcon said, is to keep both servers as close to each other as we can, because we want to run a single game with two universes. All right. So, enough of that. We started our upwell journey uh, back in 2016 with Citadels. Our goal was always to migrate all current star base, uh, stru structure gameplay into this new uh, system. Since then, we have seen Citadels 
engineering complexes and refineries. And this winter, we'll take one of the last steps in reaching Starbase feature parity. With the new fast logistics expansion structures, or flex structures for short. Flex structures are the smallest of in the structure family. Though some of them have grown a tiny bit in production. Um, I thought it was quite fitting. We're in Vegas. Bigger is better, you know? <laughs> Indeed, I like that. <laughs> but when I say small, I mean that they're quicker to anchor. Um, they, usually focus, yeah, they usually focus on a single service, so no tethering, no docking, no cargo hold, and no weapons for now. Uh, <laughs> they have a much shorter life cycle, and different from all the Apple structures, they can actually be placed within weapon range of other Apple structures. Mm. So the first batch of flexes that will be bringing your ways is the Tenebrax Sinogemma. Uh -huh, I know. <laughs> Just like before, it would block ships from jumping into your system until it's destroyed. But now it has a pretty sweet structure, and the VFX is just mind-boggling. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, more info tomorrow, man. <laughs> uh, the new Firelux Sino Beacon, it's quite similar to the old Sino Beacon, but because it's made by Upwell, you actually have access list to your Sino. Wait, are you guys excited about that? I mean, it's just access list. <laughs> and they're huge, they're huge. Um, and lastly, we have the Ansi Black's jump gate. It's... And this guy is actually replacing the old uh, jump bridge. You will have access control. So you can actually make a public gate. Uh, and unlike jump bridges, you won't be limited to linking them up to your own jump network. You can link your ANSI blacks to a jump gate controlled by another alliance. I just want to play that video again, because holy hell, look at that thing. Oh, so good. So good. Do you honestly think I'm going to tell you guys? <laughs> There'll be more information tomorrow. Lebowski is going to give you all the information. Oh, I want to keep you guys guessing. I want to. Tinfoil, tinfoil, tinfoil. So actually, while building the jump gates, the R team took a stab at all the star gates in New Eden and gave them a visual update. So we have new effects, we've renovated some of the models, and we've actually added some information onto, the, uh, onto these things. Uh, this is stuff like showing security. Uh, it's, it's owner of the origin and destination system. If there's ongoing solve contest, incursions, or incursions, incursions at the destination. So yeah, it's amazing. More reasons to look at space, guys. So, we are rolling out all these new structures and the update to the, to the uh, Stargates uh, in November. So, I really look forward to seeing the shenanigans you guys are going to pull off using these things. And, you know, for all your wonderful, you know, shout out questions, because keynotes, no questions, uh, CCB Lebowski will be here tomorrow to talk about structures, some more, at 11. So make sure you're here bright and early, super fresh. Don't hurt yourself too much tonight playing that golf thingy. Uh, I know I am because I suck at golf. I really need some skill injectors to up my game. Uh -huh. Anyway, let's continue. Um, one year ago, we rolled out the agency. 
it's been really successful in helping people to navigate to their next adventure. We've been adding to it over the year, and we felt this was a really good moment to kind of take another look at it, use our learnings, and really add to the experience. These are some super early concepts um, that we're looking at. We actually added up uh, the new player experience to the agency this fall with the goal of basically introducing new players to tools that are actually applicable to their EVE experience beyond the first moments of gameplay. The agency, agency should be the one-stop shop for all things content going forward. We will continue to work actively on the NP throughout the next year, independent from the agency. We are also looking at concepts on how players uh, fleet up. We want to break down some of the barriers around flying with others, but we will dive deeper into that after the initial release of the new Agency 2.0 in uh, 2000, uh, early 2019. So, if the Agency, help, if the agency, agency blah, 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 helps you, uh, helps you find your new next activity, the activity tracker keeps a track on what you've been up to. You can really dig into what you've achieved in EVE through the, in the activity tracker. You can see how many NPCs you've killed or the amount of charges you've manufactured. And at a glance, you can really see what type of character you are or plan what kind of character you want to be. I think this would be quite beneficial, beneficial to corporations uh, when they're doing recruiting and also when they're kind of, you know, figuring out the next conquer. There's also plenty of bragging rights hidden uh, in your tracker. I mean, who will be the first one to reach level five ship production or level five epic acts? And I actually wonder who will be the first to reach level five everything. Uh, and a uh, and, uh, much scarier thought, like how quickly that will happen. It would be like <laughs> super uncomfortable conversation. <laughs> The activity tracker is also super. In, it's also really important building block for the uh, for the future when it comes to how we deal with data outside the main game cluster. This opens up possibilities on the content side, where we can use that data to influence content and make your session even better. We've already shipped the backend for the activity tracker, and it's been running for a month to make sure that the initial release of the feature will actually work. So. Hopefully, not too broken features. <laughs> New CCP. <laughs> uh, CCP Psychonomy will go into further detail in the, on the activity tracker on Sunday at 11. His name is the hardest name, I can't say it. Psychonomy. Psychognomy. Let's call him Psychognomy. It's much better. Um, but for winter, we also, actually, we also have a couple of uh, quality of life little things coming out. The first one, I really love the first one, super simple. It's a universal search. Up there, look. Uh, it's really basic. Yeah, I mean, where have you been all my life? Like, it's amazing, you can search for things. <laughs> it's amazing. And then the second one, uh, the second one, like judging from FanFest, I want to get like a free cut. I want people to stand up and shout and scream. We're actually doing a tiny thing or an awesome thing for our PI people. Uh, you have to wait for it. We're actually introducing, wait, wait, wait for a freak out. And it happens. Yep, yep, a compact planetary overview. <laughs> CCP, CCP. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. Let's stop this, this joking nonsense and actually talk about the elephant in the room because there is one topic uh, a lot of you have been asking me about uh, or actually running after me and, and screaming at me about for quite some time. Where did you get from? <laughs> <laughs> Do I need to say it out loud? <laughs> War declarations. Yeah. So, some pretty heated conversations about war declarations in some summit a few weeks ago. Huh. I wonder how that thing made it into the, uh, into the notes. Hmm. 
Well, it's been a super hot topic, not for the last few weeks, but actually for the last few years. Uh, it's actually been a really hot topic since, you know, since we actually rolled this thing out and rebalanced it in 2012. Uh, one thing I think we all agree on is that war declarations are pretty broken. And they need love, and they need lots of love. We've done a very thorough investigation into war decks this year with player interviews, surveys, data crunching, all the things. And the findings are pretty stark. Here are some examples of what we saw. So, last year, there were five corporations <laughs> responsible for 50% of war decks in EVE. Yeah. Do you guys want to know their kill ratio? Yes. Because I have that number. Do you want to see it? Do you want to see it? Yes. So, war decks are a fair, like, super fair for everyone. Everyone enjoys them because in these five corporations, their kill ratio was 105 kills per loss. Yeah. And if we just look at the defenders, there is only about 4% of wars where the defenders managed to make a kill. I can see these guys actually managed to make a kill. <laughs> Good for you guys. <laughs> but actually, when we, uh, but we see some pretty interesting things when we start to compare wars where the defenders have a structure versus not, or structure in high actually versus not. In wars against corporations that own a structure, the average kill per war Go, uh, jumps from 0 0.034 kills per war to a staggering 1.655 kills per war. It's pretty low numbers, but this number here is 48 times higher than the other number. So that's like 48 times better. Also, we see a way healthier engagement pattern during and post-war with people that own a structure in HiSec versus not. The analytics we've done clearly show that wars with objectives are way, way, way better than wars without one. This is my shot, <laughs> Oh my god, I can't believe! I can't believe it's not better! Oh! And Guys, we've gone through a few scenarios everywhere from, you know, ripping the, the thing out to doing absolutely nothing. Um, both ends have a pretty significant impact on the game, while, you know, when doing absolutely nothing just remains the status quo. And I think we've tested that uh, route quite thoroughly. Um, and, ripping the, the, and ripping war decks out actually just moves the problem to all the features and just makes actually harder problems to solve. We're in the early stages of a design for a long-term fix with the goal of preserving the positive effect of warfare while discouraging the negative. We aim that the first release of the revamp will go out in December, where wars can only be declared against corps with structures, and then we're gonna follow it up with a new war deck system during the first half of 2019. And I'm totally going to throw CCP Lebowski under the bus again and promise you that he will talk more about this in his presentation tomorrow morning that's nicely named Structures. So, sorry Lebowski. <laughs> <laughs> this, year <we've> been, <clears throat> this year we've been keeping quite busy on our live events, with nine already done and two yet to be released. We've been expanding our tool set, allowing us to deliver more diverse content going forward. And we've also been testing some quality of life additions, such as claiming reward without having to open up the agency, which I know a lot of you guys hate. Um, for winter, we are really pushing the visuals of our events with the Crimson Harvest event on October 23rd. And then I have some pretty screenshots. And then a pretty epic looking December event staged in an atmosphere of an unknown planet. Ha, ha, ha.
nope, I'm not. <laughs> so what's actually super interesting here is that we're using some of the environment tech we, we developed for Abyssal Dead Space, and we're bringing it to known space, allowing us to set a new baseline for known space content going forward. So I'm super excited about this. But the event team isn't solely focused on PVE. They've also been building out different engagement tools, like this daily login screen. We will be testing this out on TQ soon, but going forward, we would love to get this into the hands of corporations and alliances to help keep their members engaged and distribute their wealth. CCP's Ready will dig deeper into live events on Sunday afternoon, so don't miss it. So Abyssal Dead Space, whoop, okay. So Abyssal Dead Space and events have proven to be a great way to test out new things. Both have really allowed us to push the boundaries of EVE this, EVE this year. I have CCP Rice here uh, to go a little bit more into Abyssal Dead Space and Triglavians uh, and what they're up to this winter. So give him a round. All right, hey everybody, what's up? Uh, I gotta say, I've been to quite a few keynotes. This is the most heckling I've ever seen, so good job. <laughs> but take it easy on me, though, please. No, easy, easy. All right, let's talk about what's coming up for Abyssal Dead Space. Uh, it's been about four months now since we released it, which isn't actually all that long, feels like it's been a bit. Uh, but since then, We've been studying like crazy, learning a lot about the feature, and trying to figure out what we can do to improve it. And the big thing is we need to get more people involved. Um, it's actually going super well for people who are using it. Um, you know, of course, they love the visuals. Uh, they like the challenge. They think it's exciting. They're making lots of money. Uh, the problem is almost all of them have been playing Eve for at least five years, which is kind of wild. It's like literally, you know, 60 to 70 percent is more than 400 day tenure playing if they're in Abyssal Dead Space regularly. So obviously the bar to entry is pretty high. And uh, I'm going to hold it closer. Um, <laughs> so uh, which makes sense. We know the feature can be intimidating. We designed it to be difficult. Um, and so that's what we, part of what we want to look on going forward is lowering the bar a little bit, but also uh, making sure that more types of players have a reason to use it. So keep that in mind as we go forward. So, uh, but before I actually get into what's coming in the winter, I wanted to stop a little and share some of what we've learned from the feature. Early on, we told you, and CCB Burger was just telling you, that a big motivation for creating in the first place was having somewhere we could experiment a little more bravely with the game and the engine and the visuals without having to worry about affecting uh, existing features negatively. That's worked out really well. We've learned a lot about what we can do with visuals. We've also learned a lot about NPCs and how to build PVE in general. Um, so that's great, and it's really come through. And you can expect to see more of that, both more experimentation in Abyssal Dead Space and also some of the stuff that we've developed there making its way out to events and other parts of the game. What surprised us, though, is how hugely it delivered on ability to look at what players are doing uh, and study their behavior. There's nowhere else in the game that lends itself so well to cleanly comparing player behavior and how it affects their results. The fact that we know that people are solo, they're flying a cruiser, uh, that they're on a time limit, and most importantly, that they die if they lose, um, gives us a really clear success-fail criteria that we can use to analyze a ton of stuff about what they're doing. And that's giving us information about chip fitting and reward balance and a bunch of other things. And I thought you guys might like to see some of it. Um, also, CCB Quant's not here, Rip, so I wanted to get some graphs in here somehow. <laughs> So this is my kind of favorite example so far. It's a messy graph, but what you're looking at is all the ships that have entered Abyssal Dead Space. We take them all when they enter, the ones that have any fit that makes any sense, run them through the, <laughs> which is debatable what that means, I guess, but had some criteria, run that through the uh, in-game fitting tool, and then pulled out um, higher level numbers like DPS, EHP, active tank per second, and then made graphs based on those values. In this specific one, you can see uh, active tank versus DPS for all ships entering all tiers where blue dots survived and red dots didn't. You can see there's a huge spread where the upper end is close to 1,000 DPS, 700 DPS tank, 
And not surprisingly, you can see that if you're under about 150 DPS, you're probably not going to make it. The reason this is really important is it's because of, it's one of the first times that we're actually comparing active live fits that are really being used in a broad way. Um, normally, when we look at balance, we're talking about um, pulling up PIFA and comparing what we consider optimal or pulling that from feedback from you guys. Or we're just looking at end results for, you know, we say, how many thoraxes died in the abyss and then just get like a, you know, a success ratio to compare. So this is much more sophisticated, gives us a lot more options for looking at sort of the spectrum of what people are doing rather than trying to figure out what the best thing is and how that's balanced. So we can take that and drill down a bit. So this is uh, the same graph, but only for ships that entered tier five and survived. And you can see that to succeed, you, pro you almost definitely need a minimum of 600 DPS or thereabouts. And actually, active tank isn't super important. This is probably partly because a lot of the ships that are doing so well in Abyss, of course, are passive healers. But there are ships like active sacrileges and active healers balancing this out. And even for those, you know, 400 DPS active tank is plenty. And this is really good information uh, with a lot of potential application for us. Um, whether we want to move new ships into the Abyss meta or we want to make new content, we have a really clear picture of what people are using and what's working. And then we can take these and process them some more. Here we have uh, those success and failed dots grouped into boxes. Um, and then we turn them into a success ratio, where the more green is the more chance of surviving, and the more red is the, the more chance of dying. Um, this is for all runs, and you can see that overall, if you're over 400 DPS, your chances are decent. But then if you move to tier five, you can see really clearly that to have a high chance of survival, you, you again need more than 600 DPS and probably 200 or so active tank. Um, or you can just have more than 800 DPS, in which case your tank actually doesn't really matter at all. <clears throat> <No>. <laughs> And another interesting you know, little tidbit from this graph, you can see the big red box at the top um, where it turns out that if your tank is really, really strong, your active tank, you're actually definitely going to lose, um, which you can imagine could be for several reasons. Uh, you might not have any tackle because you spent it all on cap. You uh, might have terrible damage projection. Um, you could be super slow. Those things all matter, and we can see that through this. I don't know why that would make your tank any higher. What did I say about heckling? <laughs> All right, we can do um, some other stuff with this too. We don't have to just look at DPS and tank. Um, this is a look at cost. And uh, this is the biggest clear indicator for what the bar of entry looks like. This is average cost in green for successful runs across all tiers, over 420, 450 mil, even at tier one. Of course, it's an average, and you guys are going to overspend a lot. There's a huge gap there between successful and unsuccessful. Uh, it's, it's a typo. It says millions, all right? It's hard to change it. It's a video graph. It's supposed to say billions. It's fine. Um, but yeah, the, the price, price for entry is big, and uh, that's definitely an issue. You can see how newer people or just broke people would be intimidated. Um, and last for graphs, I just wanted to quickly show you what the actual success rate looks like, because uh, Abyssal Dead Space does get a bit of a bad rap for being too hard, um, especially after what I've shown you so far. And here you can see actually about 97% of attempted runs are successful. Uh, but the blue line there along the x-axis is mission deaths. And that sort of paints a picture of why this feature looks so scary. OK, moving on to winter. So the first thing we're doing, and probably the most exciting for us, is something you might have already heard about and possibly even tried which is fleet Abyssal Dead Space runs. Uh, starting this winter, you'll be able to enter Abyssal Dead Space pockets in fleets of up to three frigates and race against a timer to collect triple the rewards. Um, we're super happy about co-op runs because flying with your friends is always much more fun. And we know that for sure. Um, but also, it helps a lot with lowering the barrier to entry. We found 
uh, so far that this is an amazing feature for experienced players to take in their less experienced friends and teach them all kinds of things that are relevant across the game, like how to fit ships, how to position in fights, how to communicate in fleets. It's all relevant in Abyssal Dead Space, so it's a great place for people of different skill levels to kind of work together and, and fly in groups. The way this works will be really similar to how everything works now in Abyssal Dead Space. It will require three filaments rather than one. They'll all be activated by one player in the fleet. Um, when they activate those three filaments together, an entry trace will spawn that can be used by anyone in the fleet, in a frigate, up until three people have entered, and then it'll just turn into a normal trace that marks their exit point. A timer will start when the first person enters, and they'll all move through the pocket together, fighting drifters, sleepers, rogue drones, triglavians, and each other if they feel like it. Uh, the timer will still be 20 minutes, and all five tiers, all five types of pockets will be available. And this is actually live on CC right now, so if you guys want to try it and let us know what you think, we'd love that. But of course, EVE isn't only about cooperation, and one of the most requested additions to Abyssal Dead Space when we launched it was some form of PvP, so we're adding that as well. Um, starting this winter, occasionally you'll find a Treglavian gate that leads to a special type of secure cache locked under a ring of Triglavian towers. It looks a little like an octagon. And if you choose to enter those pockets, uh, once you're inside, the cache will begin to unlock as the, the uh, towers lose their hold over it. And um, if you unlock it, you can collect the loot. But they're connected to multiple traces. And it's possible that another player will come in and contest you for that loot cache. And you won't get an exit gate until the cache is opened. So two will enter and one will leave. Uh, to begin with, these special pockets will only be accessible by solo cruiser runs, but we hope to expand that to frigate fleets as well if it goes all right um, after we launch it. So look for more specifics on this coming up in a dev blog shortly after eVegas. Look at those. Um, there's also some ships to tell you about. Um, as you know, uh, the Treglavians are not like pirate factions we've introduced in the past. They have new skills and use new weapons. Um, and we introduced those in the hope of building out a more fully fledged set of new tech outside of the empires. And we're adding to that. There's going to be four new ships this winter, um, added to the existing three for a total of seven precursor ships. So let's uh, take a look at them. This is the Kikimura. It's a Triglavian destroyer that follows in the footsteps of maybe Cormorants or Talwars as a long-range damage dealer. It, it'll have disintegrator damage bonuses, but also a huge amount of optimal range bonus, so it can project from a distance. And as you know, Triglavians are fast already, so it should be lethal from uh, far away. <clears throat> this is the Drakovac, the first precursor battle cruiser. Um, this is going to be the first Treglavian ship with a tank bonus in the form of added armor resistance. And that, alongside big damage bonuses, and standard battlecruiser bonus to optimal range, plus the ability to fit uh, uh, command bursts will mean this is super flexible, really nasty. Um, and we can't wait, really, for this one. And finally, two ships at once here. We have the Rodiva and the Zarmazd. These are the first precursor support cruisers, a Tech 1 support cruiser and its Tech 2 logistics counterpart. These dedicated Lazi ships will repurpose the disintegrator charge up mechanic and apply it to remote repair. <laughs> so the longer it's active on the same target, the more the rep will do per cycle. And of course, 
This will be really powerful in small fleets where Triglavians are already strong. They'll also be more powerful in controlled setups where you know you're going to fight, but they're really vulnerable to disruption and they suck if they have to switch targets. So it's a really different dynamic and we are pumped to see you guys put it to use. Uh, blueprints for all these ships will of course be found in Abyssal Dead Space. Um, but we're also going to be uh, increasing material drops so that hopefully the price comes down a little bit as well in the winter so that you can actually get your hands on them. So we're super excited for all this and a lot more. I have a ton more to tell you about in ships and modules tomorrow, so don't miss that. And for now, I'm going to give you back to CCP Burger. Thanks a lot, guys. Disorder. <laughs> so thank you, CCP Rice. Uh, pretty exciting stuff happening in Abyssal Dead Space and those damn Triglavians. That's going to be some proper shenanigans. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so there are a lot of things coming out this winter. We have a massive update to Abyssal Dead Space with more Triglavian ships, Frigate Co-op, and PvP coming your ways in November. We are diving headfirst into war declarations with the first rollout in December, and then a more complete revamp in the first half of 2019. We are giving you more ways to track and then show off your progress uh, in EVE with the Activity Tracker. All with the shifted backend, frontend will go out in November. Some pretty nice structures as well. It seems like you guys like them. Come your ways in November. And we're making finding things way more easier with ATC 2.0. Come your ways in coming your ways in early 2019. But this isn't all. We will continue to balance stuff, do server and client improvements, and little things and so on. Make sure not to miss CCP Karkur's Little Things uh, Roundtable tomorrow, and also CCP Rice's um, Ships and Balance presentation. But there are also a couple of things up here we haven't really talked about. Should we talk about them, or should we just wrap this up? Or should I keep talking? Keep talking? Sure? OK. So, the first one I want to tell you about is this thing here. Minus 2 plus 30. Producer talk. You know, I used to be a producer. I love this producer talk stuff. 28. Ah. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> so, this is an effort we're kicking off in uh, EVE development. What we're doing is that we're actually looking at the journey for new players from the moment they see an EVE advert for the first time and until they've been in the game for 30 days. Um, there's a lot of teams and efforts that go, you know, that happen during the first 32 days of gameplay. You actually see, you know, you might see an Eve AdWords. You Google the thing, because that's what people do. You're somehow recruited. You do the NPE. You might do some agent missions. You will definitely wander into places you shouldn't wander into. <laughs> Leave an example. Why am I here? <laughs> you might do some live events. You get into a corp. Uh, or your war deck, actually. That was kind of what I thought. <laughs> and you might possibly war deck someone. We need to be way better. <laughs> we need to be way better at looking at this journey in a more wholesome way, because ultimately, more players means more content for you all. Mm -hmm. I believe to get people to stay, we need to focus on the core experiences of EVE. And for me, shooting someone in the face is definitely a part of the core. <laughs> yes. We fall so incredibly short when it comes to combat feedback. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love the explosions, but the action itself, you know, we fall short. Why am I not hitting that thing? Did I kill it? Am I dead? And my absolutely, absolutely favorite is no valid target rather than you just killed CCP Falcon. <laughs> we also need to make sure people have something to do. Traditional missions in EVE haven't really changed throughout the years. We have over 4,000 missions in EVE today 
And we've even had some that are so broken, we've had to pull them out. So behind the scenes, we have even more. There, I mean, don't get me wrong, there is some great content in between, like the epic arcs, but there's also just a lot of content that needs love and needs our attention. We need to take our learnings from abyssal dead space and events, and we need to start to lay down a path to a more holistic, manageable approach to missions and PvE in EVE going forward. With the goal of that everything should matter and everything should feed into the evolution of New Eden. But I think mission content could be so much more than we have today. What if you could actually talk in a blood ready shipyard? And what if you could manufacture in a blood ready shipyard? Yeah? No? <laughs> Oh, am I falling out? What if? There's no what ifs? Oh, oh, my PowerPoint crashed. Everything is crashing. Oh, it's great. Am I getting it back? Oh, OK. No, it's on TQ. It's on TQ. Yeah, wait. This going to whoop. So let's try this again. I think mission content could be so much more than it is today. And I wonder, what, what if you could actually, you know, talk in a blood rate shipyard? <laughs> and what if you could actually manufacture in a blood rate, blood rate shipyard? Hmm. Hmm. And what if you could call for Amar backup when things go south? <laughs> and what if you could become an angel admiral and deploy the angel war machine? I don't know. The future is a, the future is a strange place. We also want to give corps and alliances more ways to put their marks on space, show their identity, and give them more, more tools to keep their members engaged. All in a lead up to an epic battle to claim territory and pride. Today, while it's pretty epic, I think we could do way, way better. I mean, at a thousand v thousand, at a thousand v thousand uh, fight, at 10% tie die and five frames per second, I mean, there is definitely some really interesting development challenges there. I know this sounds impossible in other games, but come on, we're EVE players, we want more. But this begs the question, what actually happens when there is no tight die in a thousand we thousand fight? <laughs> huh. And and guys, what happens to the meta of the game if there is no Taita in a 6,000 man fight? I mean, I don't know. The future is a strange place. <laughs> and guys, wouldn't it be cool if you could actually break line of sight by hiding your threat behind the Titan? Or confuse a volley of missiles by flying through an asteroid field? Ah, oh, so many questions, so little time. But you know, we gotta dream big. We gotta, you know, we gotta do. We gotta, we gotta change things. I can see myself waiting for a call from my FC. Palm sweaty, guns loaded. We brought around 3,000 people to this fight in groups of 10. We're actually gonna take down an idiot. I'm not gonna tell you who that idiot is, but he's an idiot. And. At the moment, my biggest worry is about a rusty sounding fax pilot next to me and if he's going to deliver, not if the servers are going to keep up. We will go deeper into these questions with you over the course of next year and possibly next few years. But I hope to have something interesting to show you and debate at EVE player gatherings throughout next year. And in this wonderful state of mind, I wish you the most fantastic eVegas, but before I leave, 
I have a little overview of the things coming out your ways this winter. I, I look forward to nerding out with you this weekend. Thank you. You can dim the lights. Do we have enough?